Hello, operating systems people. I hope you like the new splash screen. My wife says that it looks horrible. So, uh, you know, par for the course. Um, I'm Gabe Barmer. This is going to be a discussion about synchronization abstractions. We're actually going to start out by talking about locks and mutexes. Um, locks and mutexes have many different way names for actually kind of taking them and releasing them. The whole idea of starting a critical section and releasing a critical section is something that unfortunately just has many different terminologies. So lock and unlock are very common. These are often called locks. Um, the start of a critical section, the end of a critical section, protecting a data structure, it's often protected with a lock. Um, you also see a, a weight and signal used quite a bit, and we'll see this with respect to condition variables. And sometimes you see acquire and release. These are all just different terminologies for kind of the same thing, starting and ending a critical section, usually associated with some sort of an object, um, a mutex or a lock. Um, and hopefully you get the sense that Lee's just using these kind of locks or mutexes as a replacement for critical sections is, um, as a replacement for using raw atomic instructions is probably a good way to go. We looked a lot at lock-free algorithms and the exercise we did last time was in lock-free algorithms, but they're really hard to get right, they're really hard to write, and um, they're limited. They don't work for all data structures, so locks are a really good abstraction because they provide us critical sections, right? What we'll find out today is that um, they're often not just implemented as spin locks, as we've seen many times in the class, but also as a blocking um, locks. Mutexes are often blocking locks. Um, mutox, mutexes always block, whereas the term lock, sometimes it blocks, sometimes it spins. <clears throat> now, as we kind of saw before, a lot of these abstractions are built up from atomic instructions, right? So atomic instructions are um, not to, to push the word too far, but kind of the atomic parts of the system, and we combine those atomic pieces into larger abstractions that are easier to use, right? So we might, for instance, combine atomic instructions with the ability to enable or disable interrupts. Um, but of course, remember that LAT only works on a single core, um, and we might combine that with an uh, atomic instructions, which allow us to get synchronization between cores. And actually, the combination of these two things is often called a spin lock, um, which we'll see in a few seconds. Um, and we might want to actually kind of take all of that one step further and use that abstraction to implement a mutex-like abstraction that allows blocking instead of spinning. So the idea that we have these wows with the semicolon immediately following or we're spinning quite a bit, maybe we want to get rid of those because that's, hey, we're using a lot of CPU time. Um, so that's the difference between a spin lock and a blocking lock. So in XV6, we actually see that there is a hierarchy of these different synchronization abstractions created from lower level pieces. Indeed, in Linux, in our experimental operating system, in all of these systems, you kind of build this tower of different abstractions um, with some the, the atomic pieces at the bottom building up things that are more and more complex and often useful and easier to use. So we're going to be talking about a lot of these throughout this class, um, these different synchronization abstractions. All of them are present in XV6. I'm not going to talk about them with relationship to XV6, but homework 5 is going to explicitly deal with many of these, and in homework 4, you're, bit, you're good, certainly going to have to use them to some degree. Um, so at the bottom, we have atomic instructions, which are um, in xv6 and x86.h, and these provide inner core synchronization. They're actually one of the rare ways that we can actually synchronize between cores. Um, an atomic instruction is atomic not just on the single core that you're running it on, but also in that word of memory whereby you're performing the atomic instruction, um, it's atomic across different cores as well. So executing two atomic instructions on the same word in memory on two separate cores, one of those atomic instructions will finish before the other, and there's no kind of interleaving um, of the constituent parts of the atomic instruction, right? Spin locks 
use atomic instructions to um, implement themselves for intercore synchronization. Um, they provide not just atomic instructions, which you know is a synchronization on a single word, single operation on a single word, um, but they actually provide mutual exclusion, right? So now we're building up to and at critical sections. Um, spin locks, however, spin as we've seen those while wow loops that continuously be busy waiting for some condition, right? They uh, are spinning awaiting some critical section to... Um, be open so that we can go in. And usually we disable interrupts at least for the lock holder when we're in a spin lock. And the whole idea there is that if the lock holder is executing um, and within the critical section, then we do not want it to get contended and to go run some other computation on that core while other cores are spinning waiting for it to release this critical section. We really want it to uh, finish releasing this critical section. This should imply to you that spin locks are actually much more dominant within the kernel than in user level. Um, although virtual machines have kind of made that type of uh, uh, separation much more tenuous and much more challenging because, you know, we're kind of running kernels in user level with virtual machines in some way in that they can be preempted at the very least. They might think that they have access to disable interrupts, but they don't really, right? So somehow there's this problem in virtual machines. <clears throat> um, mutexes are actually built using spin locks and therefore built using atomic instructions and disabling interrupts um, but they are the next level of kind of abstraction up and they are um, commonly used in places where you might want to block so you don't necessarily want to spin waiting for somebody else to release a critical section instead you're okay blocking waiting for the other um, thread to release a critical section. So mutexes are implemented with spin locks in sleeplock.h. And then condition variables are, um, the API is a little weird in x86. We'll see what these are a little bit later in this talk, um, but they're in proc.c and it's basically the sleep and wake up API, which allow you to put the current thread to sleep and wake up a specific, wake up threads blocked um, on some condition. <clears throat> and these are implemented with mutexes, with spin locks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see we kind of want to build a hierarchy of different synchronization primitives or abstractions. Remember, that's what operating systems are all about, building higher and higher level abstractions that are easier to use while interfacing and using the raw hardware given to us, but usually trying to hide that raw hardware because it is hard. Um, Okay, so for locks mutexes, like I said, um, these have the operations to take a lock or take a mutex um, have these various names. Uh, throughout this talk, I'll be talking about lock and unlock just because they're, I think, easy to relate to. Um, acquire and release, take and release, these are also pretty easy to relate to, I think. Um, these are usually implemented with atomic instructions um, in XV6 or acquire and release in spinlock.c. Um, and for mutexes, which are blocking, it's acquire sleep, release sleep, and sleep lock. Um, the sleep in the name kind of tells you, hey, they're going to block, right? They're going to go to sleep. Um, and because these are implemented using the atomic instructions of the raw hardware, these are a lot more efficient than bakery. Um, I do not believe that they're actually, that they provide bounded weight, but that's more of a relic of XV6 being simple than kind of an inherent limitation within systems. Definitely a lot of systems do absolutely provide bounded weight. Okay, so let's dive into blocking or sleeping mutexes a little bit. What does this actually look like? What does it mean, right? Um, so now... How do we block, right? Blocking, as we've talked about in the past, is associated with kind of blocking APIs. And the idea was that we put ourselves into some sort of a block queue or a wait queue. We take ourselves out of the running state, and then we call the scheduler to allow it to run somebody else after we've been taking off of the run queue, right? So this is the same. Um, every mutex now simply has a, run, a blocked queue or a wait queue associated with it. So when 
when we want to enter into a critical section that is held by another thread, we simply get put onto that wait queue, remove ourselves from the run queue, um, put ourselves into a sleeping state, and allow the scheduler to run somebody else. And then later, when the thread wait, um, gives up the critical section, releases the critical section, it will um, call it will wake us up by removing us from the wait queue, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so when you block, you just are placing your, you're invoking kind of the, the wait call, which is like the lock call, the acquire call. Um, and that will have some logic for putting us onto a wait queue. And you see that in the bottom left here, um, we're calling the lock call, the wait call. Um, and we're just kind of keeping track of how many threads kind of want to, are, are actually blocked essentially, or trying to acquire the critical section. Um, and so we're doing this n minus minus, is, n starts out at one, one is the number of threads that can go into the critical section. And if um, that one thread has gone into the critical section and therefore, you know, n was decremented to zero, the next thread that goes through will decrement it past zero and will say, ooh, actually, I cannot continue right now. I'm going to call wait queue and queue, putting ourselves on the run queue, um, and then call block ourselves, remove ourselves from the running state, and call schedule to run some other thread. And that's literally all that's really required when we want to block ourselves, right? We just put ourselves onto some data structure so that we can track being blocked and somebody will hopefully wake us up at a later point and then we just kind of orchestrate it so that the scheduler no longer considers us for execution that is blocking that's it right um, and then wake up is the idea that we simply want to remove one of the threads from that wake queue um, and place it into the run queue um, so on the right you see signal which is the equivalent of unlock and that will increment um, plus plus, we're giving up the critical section now, so we want to allow somebody else to take it. And if there are any threads waiting to be able to go into the critical section, that's what that condition does on the right, um, then we're going to dequeue one of them from the wait queue and wake it up and schedule it. And what does that mean? Well, we're removing it from the wait queue. Wake up and schedule is going to put it into the run queue and put it into a runnable state. So that means that the scheduler will consider it for future execution, right? And that is all there that is really left for um, waking up. So on the left, when you're waiting, we put ourselves into some sort of queue. On the right, we got removed from the queue by the thread that own the critical section, right? So this is kind of a life cycle of a blocking mutex, right? It does actually raise a question though. When we do the wait queue to queue, which of the threads should we actually remove? Um, should it be the thread at the head? Should it have a uh, FIFO type semantics? Should it have LIFO based semantics? What should it look like, right? Um, so think about that a little bit. We're going to kind of revisit this question multiple times, but the answer to that question very much has a, um, a huge impact on things like bounded weight, right? Um, if it's last in, first out, um, then you are FIFO, basically. Um, sorry, if, if it's FIFO, first in, first out, um, then you're kind of just lining up and bounded weight is insured because you can never be blocked behind uh, a thread that came after you, right? Um, but if you're priority based, then, well, bounded weight is possible, but maybe you want priorities, right? So these are some of the issues that we're going to wrestle with when we get to scheduling. Um, now, there's a big question once we have this idea of locks and once we have blocking mutexes of, uh, of how we should actually use locks, right? And you all don't have that much experience putting locks into your code. You'll get some more this week, but um, probably not enough to get a very firm intuition about this. So the big question is simply... Um, which data structure should the lock protect? You can have multiple locks in your system, and each of those locks is treated as a critical section protecting that lock. Uh, but what that does mean is that you might actually have um, two separate locks, and two threads can be in those separate locks at the same time. But if two threads try to enter into the critical section defined by a single lock, well, that's when they get serialized. That's when they have to line up, and only one of them can go in at a time due to mutual exclusion, right? Um, 
And how we typically think about lists is that locks should really have an affinity to data structures. We don't really think about locks or critical sections being kind of willy-nilly throughout our code. Instead, we think, I have this data structure and I want to protect that data structure with a lock. So the question of where should your locks be is usually a question of which data structures are shared between threads and how do I want the threads to access those data structures. And we're going to just very quickly kind of review two different ways that you can think about lists. One is called coarse grain locking, which is the idea that you take a lock before you access a data structure and you kind of release the lock afterwards. Um, so very, very simple, just kind of take a lock before, access the data structure, release after. Um, fine grain locks means that the data structure itself actually has multiple locks that protect parts of the data structure, but not the entire data structure. And we'll talk about the, the trade-offs there. So imagine that we have a binary tree, a very simple binary tree, and we want to execute some sort of a remove operation on node A, which you see half the way through there. So our data structure in a coarse grain lock is just protected by a single lock. The entire binary tree is protected by a single lock. When we want to do an operation on binary tree, we take a lock, we do the operation, in this case the RM, and you can imagine that we'd walk through the, the, no, the, the, the tree, we'd find A, we'd want to trickle one of A's children up to replace A. So let's say we take the left one and replace A with that. And then all of a sudden we kind of, you know, have this new binary tree structure because we removed A successfully, right? So this is very simple. You're kind of just focusing on the binary tree logic, right? It just is happenstance that you took a lock at the start of the execution and then had to remove it when you, or unlock the lock when you were done with the RM operation, right? So this is good because it's simple, right? It's just, what's called wrapping your data structures in locks, right? It's, it's relatively easy to think about and relatively easy to reason about. The downside, though, is that big data structures will suffer from a lot of sequentialization. Sequentialization is just the notion that if we have many different threads trying to perform operations on this binary tree, they all are um, suffering from the mutual exclusion provided by the lock, which means that only one of them is executing the data structure at any point in time. We are sequentializing all of the accesses to that data structure. If your program mostly does operations on that data structure, then throwing more threads at the data structure is not going to make it faster, even if you have an infinite number of cores, right? So this can, in effect, limit the effective parallelism of the system. Um, throwing more cores at the system will not make it faster, and indeed, because locks are not free, um, might actually make your system faster, which is depressing and terrible. Um, okay, let's look at fine grain locking. So fine grain locking, same situation. We have our binary tree, um, and now we actually have a lock per node in the structure. So when we start at the top of the tree and we start looking, doing the lookup for A in the tree, well, we start at the root, so we need to actually take the lock for the root. We uh, look at the key and we find out that the node that we want to uh, look for, A, is on the right path from that um, root, so we need to actually take the lock for um, that child. Um, once we're there, we know that um, the A node is again on the right, um, so we will um, take the lock um, for A, um, but actually, going back a couple of steps, sorry, um, let's start again because I don't want to be too confusing here. At the start, we take the top lock, then we take the second lock, and then what we actually want to do is we want to release the top lock because we know that we've gotten to this point. We know that we're the only one that has access to this node because it's locked, so we want to actually release the top lock and allow another thread to descend into the binary tree as well, right? So this looks very, very different from what we saw before. We are doing an RM operation on the binary tree but 
other threads are now able to execute within the data structure, right? Okay, so we descend down into A, we take the lock for A, and now we know, okay, we want to modify A, we're going to need to modify the parent of A as well, so we're going to keep lat lock, and then we're going to modify in some way the, the left child as well, uh, maybe because there's a parent pointer or something like that. So we might end up actually taking all three of these locks for all three of for all three of these nodes. <clears throat> because we know that we have exclusive access to all three of these nodes, we can then uh, remove A and move the left child into its place, and um, we end up with something like this. And then we can release the lock and release the other lock, and we're done. Right, So that's fine-grained locking. We need to, in a very intentional way, walk through the data structure, taking a lock and then releasing a previous lock that we've taken. This is called hand-over-hand -hand locking, where you're kind of reaching in, taking a lock, reaching a little bit past, taking another lock, releasing your previous hand, and then reaching ahead, taking the next lock. It's much like you can think of it like climbing up a mountain or climbing up a, a, a cliff, uh, where you're just kind of like hand-over-hand -hand going to the next progression. Um, this has trade-offs as well. It's very good because as we kind of investigated, multiple threads can access a data structure at the same time. Notice that in the example on the left, the top node is not locked, so other threads could take the left branch um, without any problems whatsoever, right? So we can actually get parallelism within the data structure, which is to say all threads are not sequentially lining up around a single critical section for the overall data structure. They're all just accessing the parts of the data structure mutually exclusive that they need to actually access or that they need to modify, right? Um, however, um, I'm kind of simplifying a lot of the logic here. It is really hard to actually write these things and get them right. It's not as hard as writing lock-free algorithms, but, um, you know, it's somewhere in between kind of coarse grain locking and lock-free algorithms. So it's really hard to get right. Um, and additionally, locks are not free, like I said, right? The take and release calls, they aren't that long, um, but they can be a little expensive. And now we're calling those more times because we have more locks that we're taking and releasing throughout the data structure. So this can actually cause a little bit more overhead. So this is complicated, right? Nothing in engineering, nothing in operating systems is is this approach is better than that approach. It's always, what are the goals that you have? If getting parallelism within the system is your primary goal so that you can use many, many cores on the system, then you really need fine-grained locking. However, if simplicity is your goal, then coarse-grained locking is probably the right idea. There is a law that has been long-standing called Amdel's Law that... Um, really gives us an insight into this trade-off. And the idea here is that, you know, we want to increase the parallelism of a system. We want more cores to be able to speed up multi-threaded computations, right? The more threads that can execute in parallel, the faster your code should be, right? But of course, there's a problem here, right? The problem is, of course, that critical sections force mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion forces sequential execution of all threads through that critical section. So therefore, we are not able to use parallel execution for those uh, mutually exclusive critical sections. So Amdahl's law essentially just says that the parallelism speed up of the system is limited by the fraction of your code that is sequential, effectively that is governed by those critical sections. And I'm not going to go into the formula here because I don't think it's generally important to understand the trade-off, but the example is that if 5% of your code's actual execution is in a critical section um, and you have infinite number of processors, right? Like we're talking about Dyson Sphere, um, infinite number of processors beyond anything that is actually possible, right? 
that's great. You just built a Dyson Sphere and all that you can get is a 20 times speed up because all of those infinite processors are all lined up around that 5% of your code that is in a critical section, right? So Amdahl's law is basically saying that really, if you want to use parallel computation, you need to excessively limit, extremely limit, put a lot of effort into limiting the sequential code within your system, right? <clears throat> okay, the next higher abstraction over monitor, over uh, mutexes, blocking mutexes, is monitors. Monitors is a fancy term for locks plus critical sections. So I'm going to be talking a lot about critical sections. I'm going to be talking a lot about monitors. Both of these are very, are, are part, part of the same thing. A monitor is just one way to think about lows being in an abstraction. Some languages provide an abstraction for monitors. Monitors are built using locks plus critical second plus uh, condition variables. Um, okay, so monitors are a higher level abstraction that eases the programming burden of thread synchronization. What does that mean? Um, well, a monitor is really just a data structure and some associated procedures or functions to modify and maintain that data structure, okay? Um, so functions can only access the data structure and the arguments passed to them, right? So the, the functions are limited and the data structures are only operated on by those functions. There's mutual exclusion within a monitor. Now, what that means is that whenever you're executing one of these functions, any of these functions within the monitor, they are all mutually exclusive with respect to each other. So you could imagine that you are simply taking a lock at the start in the first line of each of these functions and releasing the lock on the last line of each of these functions, right? So you could, this is essentially just saying that there are all, all of the functions are protected or enclosed by the same lock. And therefore, all access to that specific data structure are protected by that lock. Now, we can implement monitors in C, but we need to use the raw locks and the raw condition variables. We don't have an abstraction for a monitor. We have to build that ourselves. Um, there are languages that support monitors or something that looks more like monitors. Um, so if functions are all kind of mutually exclusive, they're atomically executed with respect to each other. Um, this is essentially synchronized in Java. So there's a keyword called synchronize in Java that you can annotate a function with. And that essentially says that that method is synchronized with all other methods within the same object that are also synchronized. So it's just a way to essentially say, yeah, I kind of want these methods to be treated as the functions within a monitor for this specific object, right? Um, so because all of the functions are executed mutually exclusive to each other, the data structure is protected via mutual exclusion because it's only accessed and updated by those functions. So this is the idea of a monitor. If we look at what it might look like, we could um, have some name for a monitor. It might have a couple of functions inside of it, function A, function B. It certainly has some sort of uh, initialization function associated with it. And then there are the data structures associated with the monitor uh, within the monitor scope as well. Um, and this should really look familiar, right? This looks a whole lot like a class, right? It is. A monitor is effectively a class. Objects are instances of an, a monitor, each of which have a different mutually exclusive um, section, right? Because they have different data structures. So each object is effectively um, protected via mutual exclusion um, for all of its functions and the data structures then are accessed atomically um, with respect to any of those operations, right? Now, this is not really actually a very useful abstraction yet. Um, it is useful, but to make it really uh, accommodate kind of the, the full breadth of all the software that we'd actually want to write, you need to add something else. Um, one of these functions, function A or function B, might kind of want to wait for some sort of a condition within the data structure. If the data structure is a ring buffer, it might want to wait until there's data that has arrived in the ring, right? Um, 
So we need some sort of facility for allowing uh, the logic of a function to essentially block itself waiting for some future condition. And then one of the other functions, maybe function B, um, uh, adds data into the ring buffer, therefore um, waking up fun the, the thread for function A and saying, yeah, 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 your data is available in the ring, go ahead and execute, right? So we want some way to effectively block threads and wake up threads, right? Um, so, these are called condition variables, and condition variables exist in the pthreading library, um, and we're using naming very specific, very similar to what it is within um, pthreads. Um, and the condition variables are associated with some specific monitor, and they effectively have two calls, one to wait on a condition variable, and this allows you to effectively block on another wait queue, this time associated with the condition variable, but, while you're waiting, you actually release the monitor to be able to be um, uh, accessed and executed in by other threads. Uh, this is a very subtle but important thing. This is the complexity about condition variables. When you are blocking in the middle of one of these functions, if all of the functions have mutual exclusion, and if the only way that you're going to get notified of the condition on which you want to wake up, ring, the data being available in the ring, for instance, then it doesn't work that you're in a mutually exclusive section because you're blocked waiting for somebody to wake you up that needs to get into a mutual exclusive section, but you haven't released it. So condition variables have this little thing where you basically block on the condition variable, certainly, but also release the, the lock or the mutex associated with the monitor so that somebody else can then execute the functions. When those functions execute, so function B, for instance, might add something into the ring buffer, and it can call signal CV on the condition variable um, associated with the ring buffer being empty, and that will wake up any of the threads that were essentially waiting for that condition um, for the ring buffer to have a data item in it. And that will wake up the other thread, which will eventually go back and continue execution in function A. Um, let's look at what that looks like. Um, here's a simplified example where we're actually, instead of relying on the, the magic of kind of monitors and kind of it hiding synchronization and stuff like that, we're writing this more so in C where we have to explicitly create the mutexes, the condition variables, and call the functions, okay? So you can imagine wait for IO and signal IO are two functions within our monitor abstraction, um, but we have to explicitly explicitly call lock and unlock on the IO mutex um, in both of the functions, and that kind of simulates the uh, mutual exclusion that we're experiencing at all points in time when we're within the monitor, right? So now any execution within either of these functions is mutually exclusive with respect to the other. A thread can be computing in signal IO, but not in wait for IO, right? It's all mutually exclusive. Okay, so what is this example? It's very simple. This is kind of simulating an IO subsystem where we have a single uh, Boolean variable IO ready, and that's basically true or false whether IO is ready or not. There are other data structures associated with that IO, but I'm just not showing them here, right? So if we want to get IO, if we want to wait for IO, then first thing that we do is check if IO is ready. If IO is ready, great. We just set IO equal to false because we're going to go consume the IO, right? We're going to go um, get the, the IO from the device, um, return it, um, but not before unlocking and allowing somebody else to go into the monitor, right? Um, however, if on the left, in that condition, the IO is not ready, well, we want to block. This is a this this is a blocking API. So we're actually going to increment a variable of how many threads are blocked waiting for IO. And then we're going to wait on the condition variable called the IO block list. Um, and the pthreads API requires us to pass in the IO mutex associated with the monitor as well. Um, again, this is because we kind of need to release that. We'll see why. And then on the signal side, we essentially want to add I.O. Um, from the device into the data structures, right? Again, we're just kind of using the true-false uh, 
uh, function for kind of a proxy for that. We're just locking and then if um, there are blocked um, threads waiting for IO, well then we better wake them up. We're adding IO into the system. They better be allowed to be able to access it, right? So we signal condition variable that should wake up um, at least one of the threads or kind of a varying semantics, one where it wakes up all, one where it wakes up a single. Um, here let's imagine it wakes up a single thread. So we signal and it wakes up a single thread that was waiting on that condition variable. We decrement and blocked, set IO ready to true, add the data into the data structure, um, not shown here, and then unlock. At some later point, hopefully that thread will be able to uh, wake up, right? Okay, so let's kind of in a more guided way go through the semantics here, right? So we wait for IO, right? So on the left, we have a thread that goes through, calls wait for IO. Great. It, go it does not find data, so it increments and blocked and calls wait CV right so that's where it blocks and then later we're going to execute the second thread which calls signal io adds the data into this abstraction um, and notices that there are block threads calls wake up um, which will um, wake up the threads waiting for the condition variables right but i really want to emphasize again here this main point that something very weird is happening here because if when we call wait cv notice we on the left here we've taken the lock we've taken the lock for the io mutex okay so we've taken that lock which means mutual exclusion is happening um, the signal i no thread could call signal io right now right and then we call wait cv which blocks but now if we are running and we're waiting for the thread to call signal IO, but the thread cannot call signal IO because when it tries to, it blocks on the lock because the lock is still taken by the thread that is now blocking on the left, we have a big problem. So condition variables are a little bit more complicated than just a wait queue um, that is there to kind of track threads and wake them up later. Um, instead, it includes three kind of logical operations. First, we actually release the IO mutex, and that's why we have to take IO mutex as an argument in the pthreads API, because we're going to re release that lock. Now, this is weird, right? It means that now that we've released the lock, when we wake up, anything could have changed because any other thread could have modified the data structures in the meantime. So when we're using condition variables and we wait on a condition variable, we have to assume that when we've woken up, the entire data structure could have changed, right? So this is a, a little bit difficult to deal with. Okay, so we release the lock and then we block. Great. Um, so we've blocked. Then we receive. Then because we release the lock, the other thread can go into the, the signal I/O. It can call signal CV, which calls wake up and tries to wake us up. And at that point, when we do wake up, let's assume that this uh, thread in signal I/O goes through and does its own unlock. The scheduler eventually runs the first thread and wait for I/O. And when it wakes up, the first thing that it does is retake the lock. Notice. We don't see that. We're just calling the wait CV function, but the wait CV function does these three things, right? Um, so then we've retaken a lock. We can go and access the data structure. We can go and get the IO, right? So this is effectively what condition variables allow us to do. They allow us to block, which, I mean, they're, they're, you haven't really learned another way within any of the APIs that we've looked at throughout the class to kind of coordinate between threads in this way, where one can block waiting for something arbitrary to happen, and another thread can effectively wake it up um, at a reasonable point in time in the future, right, when that thing happens. And this is what condition variables allow us to do, but they have this difficult semantics. <coughs> okay. Um,
So let's dive into a little bit more of what this weight CV and the signal CV look like. I just want to reiterate this one more time, right? So the first thing when we are waiting on a condition variable, waiting for some sort of event to happen, that we do is we unlock. We unlock the mutex. Then we add ourselves to the wait queue, remove ourselves from the running state, put ourselves into a block state or a sleeping state, and then schedule to allow the scheduler to run some other thread. Um, now we're not in the run queue, so we won't be run. Um, at some later point, a thread will call signal CV, which will call wait queue remove, which will remove a, that thread, uh, a thread from the wait queue associated with the condition variable, put it into the run queue, put it into a run, runnable state. Um, and then at some later point, the scheduler will run and um, uh, run that woken thread, right? And it's up to the scheduler when it does that, right? But this is kind of the logic behind condition variables, and this is about it. Notice the wait actually does lock and unlock operations. Signal does not. Signal does not need to release lock. It just needs to wake up the thread associated with the 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 um, uh, condition variable. So signaling you still have your mutual exclusion. Waiting, you gave up your mutual exclusion when you called wait. Okay. <clears throat> There's a problem with this code. There's a problem with this code because it's actually wrong. And it's wrong partially because of what we just revealed, right? When the left thread calls wait for IO and does a wait condition variable, it releases the mutex. So therefore, when it wakes up, when the wait CV function returns, the entire state of the data structure could have changed. We actually don't really know what IO ready could be. We don't know what n blocked is. So typically, you need to recheck the state that's important to you before you continue executing when you wake up from a wait. So let's go through the, the there is a race condition effectively. There's an interleaving of threads that we need to be careful of here. Now, when we have mutual exclusion, we don't need to worry about interleaving. But now we're adding interleaving because wait CV releases the lock, which means there's only a, a, a critical section between lock if and block plus plus and wait CV. But we kind of release that critical section when we call wait CV. And it retakes a, the critical section when we return from wait CV. But in the interim, between those two actions, there can be interleaving. And we're almost guaranteed that there's going to be interleaving because we blocked, right? So there's a big problem here, right? So let's go through the condition. Okay, so we have thread one that comes in, calls wait CV, and blocks, okay? We have thread two, because part of wait CV is to uh, release the lock, uh, release the IO mutex in this case, the second thread can come in, notice that that thread is blocked, call wake up on it, right? And at the point of wake up, that thread that was blocked, thread one in this case, will get woken up and put onto the run queue. But we make no guarantee, so it's no longer blocked, we'll go onto the run queue. Um, but we're assuming arbitrary interleaving. The scheduler can decide to run any thread that it wants. And if instead of running thread one at that point, thread three comes through and gobbles up all of the IO that thread two added into the data structure, right? The one percenter just comes in and eats all of the wonderful, luscious IO that thread um, two added in. Then we have a problem because thread two set IO ready to true, but then thread three came in and set IO ready to false. There is no more IO. Thread three actually consumed it, right? So now when we finally are able to switch to thread one, there is no more IO, right? Um, sad face, single tier, thread one wakes up and immediately it tries to access the IO and it's not going to find any, right? So there's a very simple way that we kind of fix these types of problems. It's we have to acknowledge that when we call wait, we are breaking the critical section. So 
we need to say, all right, when I wake up from wait, the entire state of the data structure might have changed. So what I need to do is instead of have an if where I'm checking, if the IO is ready, then do the wait, I typically am going to need to have that be a while. So that when I wake up from the conditioned variable, I'm going to need to recheck the data structures once again to see whether they actually have IO ready, right? Another thread might have come through and stolen our IO from us, right? Um, the greedy one percenter might have come in and nom 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 ate it up, right? Um, instead, um, we need to check again to see if it's available. And only if it is, then we continue. If it's not, then we need to, unfortunately, block waiting again, right? Okay. Um, an important exercise that I'd really like you to do is actually try to implement um, condition variables using mutexes. It's um, not easy. Okay, so monitors are really important, condition variables are really important, but there are actually other structures that we care, other uh, synchronization abstractions that we care about as well. Um, there are many data structures that might be read mostly. We might actually try to get information from them often, but actually modify them relatively infrequently. Um, there are caches that are the backbone of many operations in many data centers. Um, for instance, when you go to your Facebook wall, um, Facebook will make about 200 to 400 different queries to memcache servers. Memcache is just a cache. All of the items that you see on your Facebook page are each of those individual requests for cache data. And what you're essentially trying to get is a quick access to some of those data items that you're trying to render onto your um, homepage, right? And all of those caches are read mostly. We're reading the data out of them, getting the items that you want to post onto your um, homepage most of the time. We are not actually modifying them that often, right? <clears throat> so if we have these data structures that are read mostly and written infrequently, then it kind of actually doesn't make sense to have mutual exclusion. Readers don't really conflict with each other. If you are not, uh, <coughs> if you're not changing a data structure at all, then two readers can read the same data structure at the same time. You don't require mutual exclusion for readers um, between each other. However, if somebody is writing to a critical section, then no readers and no other writer should be able to get into that critical section. But to write readers, yeah, they're fine together, just as long as there's not a writer, right? Um, <clears throat> so if we look at a reader-writer lock, you can actually implement a reader-writer lock using just mutexes. So again, we can implement a more complex synchronization abstraction that has some benefits using those pieces, those abstractions that we came up with before for things like mutexes. So how do we do this? Well, we actually need two mutexes to implement a single reader-writer lock. The writer on the right is very simple. Um, we have a write mutex and we simply lock it and unlock it be before and after we do anything with the data structure. So that's simple. That just looks like normal mutual exclusion. And that makes sense, right? Because a writer, like if there is a writer, then nobody else can be accessing the data structure at all. There's extreme mutual exclusion, right? However, on the left, the reader gets a little bit more complicated, right? The top chunk of that reader code is essentially saying, okay, I'm going to have a mutex that I can lock that is going to essentially kind of be for all of the writers, for all of the readers in some way, right? It's going to be coordinating amongst the readers. And the first thing that that critical section defined by that reader mutex is going to protect is just a count of the number of readers. So we have this read num and we're doing a plus plus. If we are the first reader to try to take the lock, then we try to take the writer mutex. This is really, really clever and really, really important. 
because if there's already a writer in the critical section, that is going to prevent us as the first reader from actually getting into the critical section, which is what we want. The writer cannot have anybody else accessing the data structure at the same time as is making modifications to it, right? Second, on the left, when we see the reader, if we are locked waiting for a writer, then other readers that try to enter into the data structure will be blocked on the mutex, the outer reader mutex, right? So, in some sense, we will only ever, um, <clears throat> well, we'll have one reader locked on the writer mutex and then the rest on the reader mutex. Okay, great. If the writer gives up its lock, then the first reader will be able to um, return from, will be able to take the writer mutex and um, essentially break out of that condition. And then it will unlock or release the reader mutex. Now that's really important, right? Because that is going to allow any of the other readers that are trying to go into the critical section to be able to access it now, right? So we're actually unlocking the mutex that the other readers are actually trying to um, go into, which allows them to just kind of flow through this code and go into that read data structure function all at the same time. So we have no mutual exclusion between the different readers because they can all pour in at that point. When we, when any of them are done reading from the data structure, they're going to again take the reader mutex to organize themselves. That's mainly there again to protect this read num uh, uh, variable and we're going to decrement that. If we are the last reader to uh, release that reader mutex, then we'll also release the writer mutex, right? So this is essentially saying any number of readers can kind of come in and do whatever they want to um, to the read data structure, but then when the last one gets out, then we're going to release that writer mutex, which then might allow a writer to go in. This is what's called a reader biased lock, which is to say if there's an infinite stream of readers and writers trying to take their two locks, the readers, once they get the lock, will always win and never allow the writers to be able to um, execute. Um, there are also writer bias locks and there are also more intelligent locks that kind of try to switch back and forth between the readers and writers. Um, but that's beyond kind of what I want to go over here. Um, okay, what are the downsides to reader-writer um, locks over mutexes, right? There have to be downsides to this. Um, think about it for a second, come back. Of course there are downsides. Look at the complexity of the code on the left. Not only is that more complex, we also have um, double the locks and double the lock operations for... Um, doing kind of a simple kind of take of a reader lock and a release of a reader lock. So these are tend to be actually more expensive um, in terms of a lock implementation than just normal mutexes, right? So these are not free. Um, they also, you have to solve that bias issue, whether if you want to um, allow bounded weight for both readers and writers, you have to solve the bias issue and kind of switch back and forth. And that's not that simple. Um, okay, there are a lot of different abstractions that um, people use for organizing synchronization and parallelism and concurrency. I'm not going to go into all of them in this class. These are the major ones that you really need to know um, to be able to understand how programming languages work and how a lot of environments work. Um, but I want to put a lot of these into perspective. So the view from high up here is that... Um, you know, if synchronization is the problem, we just want things to be able to access data structures and be protected by uh, um, our synchronization, why not just kind of essentially have, you know, a lock and an unlock, a wait and a signal um, around all of the computation in main, um, have the start of every thread take the same lock, release the same lock, whatever it becomes really easy to synchronize between all of them, right? But this is the coarsest granularity of locks possible, right? Um, Linux, I think, yeah, Linux before version 2.0 um, actually used lists 
to orchestrate its kernel code. It used what was called a big kernel lock. And the idea there is effectively that there is a single lock protecting the entire kernel. Whenever an exception, a system call, anything like that happens, you take the big kernel lock, and then when you are about to return from that system call that exception, you release it. And what that effectively means is that the kernel can be executing on exactly one core at any point in time. But when we started getting multiple sockets, multiple CPUs, multiple cores, obviously having one big lock protecting the entire kernel is not a good idea, right? So locks are really a necessary evil, and fine-grained locking is complex, but also very much a necessary evil. So on the right, what you see is a, a kind of um, artistic rendering of the situation where... If we have very little synchronization at the very bottom, um, that's bad because we have race conditions that mean that our data structure accesses are going to be incorrect in some way. As we add more and more synchronization to the system, we're going to have correct programs. And if we have too much synchronization into the system, the critical sections are protecting too much of the execution, then we end up with a situation on the left where we have a big lock and we have effectively no concurrency, right? So the sweet spot for correct programs is somewhere in between race conditions and complete sequentialization, basically. Um, and it really comes down to the goals of your system for how important it is for it to execute well under multiple cores um, for how you should choose to deploy locks. And your main tool is essentially using read-write locks if you have read-mostly data structures. Um, uh, using fine-grained locking where you absolutely have data structures that are expensive and you want multiple threads to be able to access them, etc. But you pay in complexity and you pay in some overhead for these types of things. We will find out in the next lectures that there's also something called deadlock that effectively is um, unfortunately somewhere interleaved amongst your quick your correct programs where locks can interfere with each other in bad bad ways and we'll be talking about that quite a bit in future lectures so thank you very much i hope you in, enjoyed talking about synchronization abstractions um this kind of puts to close one of the more complex parts of the class um let's make sure to talk about it in class we'll be returning to the revolution this time with the locks taking over all right talk to you soon